discuss. Okay, um, and this is about models of control. This is again issues with model implementation. This has some broader linkages, just like what we just saw linked in with issues of directionality and density and two phase commits, etc. So it is with and, and issues of dependency and concurrency. So it is with this issue of models of control. Um, so when we look at any logic, um, it's a platform that that makes heavy use of what's called the Hollywood principle. Does anyone know the Hollywood principle? Hollywood principle? Okay, it's sometimes described as don't call us, we'll call you. Um, traditionally, any log uh, traditionally asynchronous models were written in, in a big four loop. The big loop over just plus, over the other loop, you know, over time, um, over time. And for each one time, you would iterate over just plus, instead of A. Agents they iterate over all the agents. So time zero, we go over all the agents and they do their agent max. Time one, we go over all the agents and they do, do all their agents. Time two, over all the agents. And, and again, you have to be careful here because you don't want to impose this artificial ordering on the agents, right? Agent zero gets to go first always. Therefore, has this weird relationship with the other agents. They're never affected by other changes. Agents, in this but that's the model. And the truth is, for decades, students have been mostly exposed to a, a model of computation of top down. He says, when you first write your your initial program in PMP. 140 or 141 or 145, often you're writing the program circle, double run and call this and call that and do that and that. And they're kind of top down. They delegate things down to the level, but they, they run. And a lot of modern software makes use of a different model, but it takes you to third or fourth year before you're exposed to things uh, in this sphere. Whether it's uh, uh, writing code for a web server or for Adobe Flask, or whether you're putting in place code in the context of uh, of a database with stored procedures or what have you, um, these days a lot of code is written in a way that is called by the frameworks. Um, so traditionally, ABMs made use of direct calls down. It was top-down sort of model in the sense that they were calling off to different things and there'd be a big for loop and an inner loop within it over agents, et cetera. Um, but, you know, in the past decade or two, what you've seen is the framework come up. And it's the same thing elsewhere in software. Um, code is written in frameworks and your code is called by other code. You're putting in snippets of code that get invoked at certain times. And you're kind of fitting them in as as these bits into to a, a larger system. This is in contrast to these libraries, which we call out to our code calls out to. Instead, we're getting called. Our code is getting called. Um, and this is according to the to the Hollywood principle: Don't call us; we'll call you. We will call you when the time is right. Um, this is true in many spheres of software development right now. Um, and it goes back in some of its earlier prominence to the early days of windowing systems, where basically to write a window program, I know the people who wrote WinWord, for example, Windows Word, or Mac Word, et cetera. And there, a lot of the time, the code was called by when an event happened. For example, when a click occurred, this will be uh, this will be invoked. Uh, there are these things called win props. In 
so it is with within any logic. So we saw in our lecture we just finished on models of functions in a base model that we have these pieces of code that we set up to be called the right time. So there's this on before step and on step. So on before step, this code gets called. On step, this code gets called. It gets called at a certain time, and the framework will take care of calling. Um, so it is with more complicated models. This is a from our our uh, Saskatchewan uh, hybrid ADF for companies uh, with these daily. And there's this persistent asymptomatic state, and a certain event occur within this state. The state of code is invoked in this state. When we enter the persistent asymptomatic state, this code is run. And it increments the variable and it records, yes, I had a systematic infection, and my death has the rate, and it's determined by something, and the may plus two is the life of you. Um, okay, so so this isn't this is kind of um an exemplar or kind of indicative of this sort of program. We're putting in these snippets of code in places that get invoked. And who invokes them? Well, the framework does. Um, same thing with these rate events. So when we have these transistors, uh, we get these rate events that occur that fire off certain code when this transition is taken. So in the event this transition is taken, boom, this code will be executed. And we basically build up these models by putting in place these snippets of code associated with these state charts to be invoked when at the right time by the framework. Um, okay. Um, now there are uh, there's this additional structure called an event within any model. An event will go off at certain times to undertake certain actions, and I think we actually saw that within the model that you would have built up uh, following that that video. So here, here's an initial event, for example, uh, which is set to go off once at time zero, and it delivers a message to the initial agent to infect them, right? So the whole purpose of this event is to get this code called at the right time. There's another event up here, record weekly incidents. So basically, it's fired off weekly. Starting at week one, so one week in, it is invoked every subsequent week, and this code is run. This is something called an event. It's very useful for reporting. Of course, it's reporting information periodically, and that's exactly what this is doing every week. And it's recording some information. So once again, this is emblematic of this notion of don't call us, we'll call you. When you go into any logic, you don't tell it, you know, start this, start that, do this, do that. You, you actually put in these little hooks of code, these little bits of code, these snippets, which are then invoked by the surrounding framework. And that framework will call them at the right time and under the right conditions. Um, so uh, this is part of the kind of methods of much of modern software engineering is using these frameworks to get a test and setting up code in a framework that will be invoked. Quite different from traditional agent-based models, um, but uh, it allows an economy of code to be imposed, so you can specify specified less code. Um, so, um, you know, we see this at many levels. Uh, one of them is when agents are started, even there's events. These are not based on state terms, but if you go and you click on events, that's what they call on startup. So, when that event, when main is started, the entire model is started, you say, hey, do this. 
when you're going to get started up, go undertake these actions, go open this database, or go create this file, or go record this logging information, or what have you. So this is what we call, from a software perspective, inversion of control. If you go to work with practice and software here, you'd be hard pressed to go a couple of years without working with practice and software. Inversion of control is all about, it's not you saying, do this, do that, do that, in a set wording voice or not, to, to, the, to the library. It's instead, we're getting called by these frameworks around us. Uh, very different. And it has some advantages. It has some disadvantages too, but we'll talk about the advantages here uh, for a minute. Uh, so we can specify a way that's a module um, to be independent of the implementation. Um, it can allow the implementation of the surrounding system to be out. As long as you get all, you don't have to worry about it. It's easy to engage in unit testing for a lot of these but it is true for a lot of these frameworks. Um, you can put in place mocks and fakes for, for pieces of code. Um, and you can insulate the user code from the complexity of how the framework as a whole works, the transactions, the persistence, and database connections, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know, when we're dealing with transactions, persistent um, database connections, a lot of those can be provided in this in the same sort of way. The disadvantages here are things you probably encounter, maybe with any logic, maybe with other software. Um, there's no sort of clear locus of control. You can't trace the entire system from start to finish, like you could probably in the first couple of programs you wrote in 140 or 141. Where you could go top down, sort of what was going on at each point. It's really clear. Here, you know, it's a little bit mysterious, right? We kind of put our code out there and we trust it will be invoked at the right time, but something much bigger than the code is taking care of all the choreography. And we just have to sort of trust that, okay, it's good to call. And it can lead to the sense there's no there, there. There's no no one place I can point to and say, this is exactly where the system is. And it's not clear how the how things work. It can be hard to know, to know where to find things. And sometimes testing can be, can be hard. Um, there's uh, many sorts of uh, implementation strategies for inversion of control. It's very, very widely used. Um, but any logic adheres to this kind of event-based version of control where there's kind of this publish subscribe model and these things are invoked at the right time at the right place uh, uh, by virtue of, uh, of, of being uh, of, a, of a certain sort or, or having an event that, that is scheduled to have its, have its uh, code invoked at the right time by the, the overall framework. So just be aware that when you're running uh, in an ABM like any logic, this is emblematic of a general trend in software development towards what are called inversion of control. In the Hollywood version, it's not called our control. If you get up here 20 years ago at ABM, you would have found this top down loop. It's fine, it's looping over agents. Now, it's a matter of snippets of code placed into the system and invoked by the system itself at the right times under the right conditions in ways that don't allow quite as much transparency, but do reduce the amount of code we have to write and allow the framework to evolve um, separately from the models themselves. So we can load our models into successive, into successive versions of any logic. Okay. So those are all my comments for today. Two topics related to implementation. On the one hand, topics on models of time and uh, their relationship to, to sort of model complexity.
um, this issue of discrete time requiring some conscious awareness traditionally about the ordering of things and, and preventing problems due to dependencies and continuous time along the more natural um, but fairly uh, but performance involved um, scheduling being required. And then uh, here, models of control. Um, inversion of control, don't call us, we'll call you. Next time, I think we'll be going on to networks and we'll talk about implementing networks in any bar. But more deeply, we're going to talk about how different network types have different structures and different behaviors associated with them. And you'll be seeing that what sort of network is involved has huge implications for, amongst other things, you know, how contagion spreads, for example, with infection. So that's what we'll be talking about on Thursday. Thank you very much. And I appreciate everyone who's uh, coming here in, in person. That's, uh, that's great. Let's keep the numbers up. And uh, hopefully, as it gets safer yet, we can, uh, we can have additional, uh, additional people in the classroom. So thank you.